My name is Kathy Carpenter, and I work in the Community Health Division on CD. I'm a TV control nurse, and also serve on the Infection Control Committee. Um, there's not a lot of changes this year to present to you for the um, infection control training. Um, so you probably, if you've been here for a while, will be very, very familiar with these slides. Um, first of all, we always want to know, why do we have to do this training year after year? Um, the reason is, is that there is a rule established that requires us to do this infection control training annually. Um, any organization, health organization like ours, that performs any kind of invasive procedure, such as needle sticks um, or any dental procedure, for example, that, that may have some bleeding, requires us to, to do this training. Um, this infection control um, statute or rule also says that we have to have a written infection control policy, and we have to make sure that everybody understands this policy and is trained. We also have to make sure throughout the year that we uh, monitor compliance with this policy. And we want to make sure that these policies are updated if there are any um, changes that are needed. And we want to make sure that we prevent the transmission of blood-borne pathogens. We also know from this um, statute or rule that there should be at least one person within the uh, public health department that is trained with infection control um, standards. And I have, been, I have gone through that training as have other people on the infection control uh, community and other people within the health department. And there is a statewide um, infection control training. Um, it's called SPICE. And that is one of the ways that you can receive the annual training. So we're going to talk a little bit about the annual training that um, we do here at the health department. Today we're going to talk about standard precautions. And some of those precautions are hand hygiene, the use of personal protective equipment, safe injection practices, and just safe handling of potentially contaminated equipment or surfaces within our environment. Um, part of our training that we do here also is the bloodborne pathogen training, and that training is um, by people who um, need that training, meaning that you have potential risk for exposure to bloodborne pathogens. There is a PowerPoint presentation for that, and you take a quiz after you have completed that. And usually that's required to be done just before you have your annual performance appraisal, so you need to make sure that you stay current with that. Nobody's going to tell you it's time to do it. You have to make sure that you make a note on your calendar and, and, and fulfill that obligation. Also, those people who work, um, for instance, myself in the TB um, control department, um, we have a respiratory protection program, and we go through um, respiratory fit testing once a year, and also Pat Gentry includes in September when we have our other trainings, um, the respiratory fit education. And all of this is um, uh, documented on your performance appraisal, and also there's a training log that you need to complete to show that you have um, completed all of this training. So before we go on and talk to talk about the infection control, um, let's talk a little bit about the difference in being colonized with bacteria and infected with bacteria. So what is the difference? Um, we know that people can carry bacteria and they're not sick. They don't have evidence of being actively um, ill. They don't have an elevated white count and they don't have fever, for instance. These people have bacteria that's just colonized in their body. But we do know that infection can develop from bacteria that's colonized. Um, and we can transmit uh, this bacteria from one person to another from us as healthcare providers to our patients. So we can transfer this just by through our hands and through equipment that we use in our healthcare setting. So it's important to remember that bacteria can be transmitted even if a patient is, um, if a patient is um, not infected or sick. So what can we do? Here's a little visual that helps me think about this. Um, there's the iceberg there, um, and it, you can see that just the top of the ice cap is the infected group of people, if you want to look at it that way. And then down below is the potential for infection by looking at the huge colonized population. So we go about trying to um, make sure we don't, um, that we have good precautions by talking about standard precautions, and this is what we all practice here at the health department. It's the minimum infection prevention practices that we use to prevent transmission of diseases that can come when we're in contact with blood or bodily fluids. 
um, it should be used when we uh, provide care to all individuals here at the health department, whether we think they're sick or not. And most of the people that we see here at the health department and most of the clinics are not considered to be sick. So the um, standard precautions we know are, is the basic level of infection control. It's used in the um, care of all patients to reduce the spread of um, infection. And the standard precautions that we will talk about today are hand hygiene, use of personal protective equipment, cough etiquette, and the safe handling of potentially contaminated environmental um, equipment or surfaces, and safe injection practices. So what is hand hygiene? <coughs> hand hygiene is just washing your hands with soap and water. It can also mean using antiseptic hand wash or some of the alcohol-based hand rubs that we have here at the health department. And also, in some settings, the surgical antisepsis. So there have been studies done, and I've just kind of quoted here, there were some studies I looked at last year that um, that's an aseptic task, you should be using hand hygiene. If you're uh, working with a patient and you're moving from a clean part of their body to a contaminated body site, and by, by, vice versa, you should be um, washing your hands or doing hand hygiene. And also before putting on gloves and after glove removal. Did you all know that you should do that with the glove use before you put on your gloves and once you take them off? Okay, so here are the five moments just summarized as to when you should use hand hygiene. We just talked about those. Okay, so hand hygiene can be used with soap and water or with alcohol-based hand rub. But it's just the most important thing that I'd like for you all to get out of this training today or this um, review is that it is the cornerstone of infection prevention. Here are some of the alcohol-based hand rubs that we use here at the health department. I'm sure you've seen all of these. When you come into the employee entrance, there is a dispenser there with the hand gel. It's important to know that when you use the hand gel, that you should place enough of the alcohol in your hand that you can rub your hands together and cover all of the surfaces of your hand in between your fingers and make sure that your hands dry. And it's important also if you purchase hand gels, even for home use, that you should make sure that it has 60-95% alcohol to be effective. So we know that alcohol-based hand rubs um, sometimes have an advantage over hand washing with soap and water. Um, it requires less time with us than hand washing. It works quickly to kill microorganisms on the hands. It can be more effective than hand washing with soap and water. And the reason we say this is that most of the time people do not properly wash their hands. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, using an um, alcohol-based hand rub can also um, come in handy when you don't have um, access to um, a sink. And also the alcohol-based hand rubs can be less irritating um, to our hands and it can 